I'm Bruce Worson, pastor of His Place Community Church. The following message came from a Sunday morning right here at His Place. What are you hungry for? Be honest about this. What are you hungry for? Are you hungry for more money? Maybe more meaning? Maybe a better body or a bigger house or a bigger body and a better house. I don't know how you like it. Maybe you're hungry for people's approval or maybe it's just personal space. But whatever it is, there is something that you desire that you don't have And that is called being hungry. And we all know it. We all feel it. And because we're all unfulfilled, we all live in a world that is full of frustration and irritation and desperation and exasperation. In fact, this is actually where we get to agree with Buddhists. This is, we we can agree on this one. All of our suffering stems from our unmet desires. That's it. That's what suffering is. That's how you define it. It's just not getting what you want. So before you spend thousands of dollars on marriage counseling or family therapy, trying to figure out what is the source of all of your stress, well, let me let you in on a big existential secret. You're not you when you're hungry. Uh Uh-huh, that's right. All those Snickers commercials are equal parts advertisement and public service announcement for mental health. That is true. That is true, and you need to know it. It's good for you, because like last week, we discussed this whole idea. Trying to live as anyone other than the real you is a recipe for disaster. Because when you do that, you run the risk of playing the twonk, remember? You don't want to be that guy. You want to be the real you. And our only guarantee of living life to the fullest comes from fully following the author of our adventure, regardless of how hard the path appears, because it's going to be hard. That's on purpose. Because only he, the guy who wrote the story, your story, only he can lead us to play our part to its full potential. Only he gets what we're supposed to be doing down here. And guess what? The author tells us who we are meant to be is directly tied to where we are meant to be. You ever read this one? For while we are in this tent, our earthly dwelling, in this tent, down here in this body, while we're down here, we groan and are burdened. Because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. That's what we want. Now, the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit. You know, think of that like a taste to guarantee. It's guaranteeing what is to come. That's why you got that little deposit, that taste. That is it. That's the whole thing right there. We're hungry for home. That's that feeling. You feel it every day. You're hungry for home. And being homesick just hurts more than any other ache there is. Because it affects every other feeling that we can feel. It's just all of them. And that's because our whole standard of comfort, you know, like what feels good, it comes from home. That's where we get the idea of what comfort is. That's what home is defined by. Home is the base we use to appraise everything else. That's the standard of comfort, which is why the most heartfelt compliment that we can give to any experience is to say, it made me feel at home, right? Like, that's why Airbnbs became such a big thing. It's because it was like, wow, this is like a real home. It feels homey. That's just nice and way more comfortable than this five-star hotel. Forget that. So (laughs) similarly, though, here's the flip side of that coin. Similarly, that, that same standard is why our discomfort is determined by differences from home, right? And the most alienating criticism then that we can give to some experience is to say it felt foreign, you know, or it felt unnatural. That just not like home. That's when we really know that we didn't like it. And that doesn't mean that it's necessarily all bad. It just means that it can't completely satisfy because we don't completely fit like you do at home. Because only the real home of the real you can offer that kind of satisfaction. And so think of it this way. Here's an analogy I think I heard a long time ago. It's like going on vacation, right? You go on vacation, and you love the idea of going on. It's vacation, right? Like, it's exciting. It it might be exciting and inspiring, but no matter what, it is foreign, and it feels 
foreign everywhere you go, right? There's still different food. Some of it's good, and this is fun, but it's different. Different food in different environments. I went to London once, and I had dinner in the crypt underneath a church. And I was like, this is good, but weird. Like, there's dead bodies all underneath us. I don't know how I feel about that. So I was like, this is, uh, but it's not right, you know? But that's it, different environments. There might be different customs and even a different language, right? Which is all fun, kind of, but it's also not great. And at the end of the day, you get into a different bed, and the sleep just isn't as good. Never is. So what do we do? You know what we do. We try to make it home. We try to force it to be home. Some of us bring a blanket or a pillow. You're one of those people, got a pillow everywhere you go. I've met those like in your car, they just have that pillow. They're like, I need this. Your blanket or your pillow. Or some people pack their favorite snacks. I'm one of those guys. Like, I don't know what they're going to have to eat. So I got my, you know, nuggets right here that I'm going to eat. Anyway, but you got your, your home snacks or something. Some of us need a white noise machine. Or some of us, like my kids, need seven pairs of shoes for a three-day trip somewhere <laughs> just to foster that familiar feeling. Like, I'm at home, I'm at home, I'm at home. But whatever it is, whether it's, you know, converting your currency or downloading Google Translate because you got to make it feel like home, it's out of instinct, that we adjust our environment, do everything we can, we adjust our environment to make it feel like home. Because deep down we know the real you is only satisfied by your real home. And since the real you belongs up there, down here just won't cut the mustard. It can't. It can't give you what you need. Try as we might, we can't quite adjust this environment to make it feel like home. You know, we're always trying. It's our prayer, right? As, you know, on earth as it is in heaven, we want to make it that way. But it just, we, we haven't succeeded yet. We want to make it feel like home. And if, if that doesn't work out, then that's when we're presented with our only other option. Another instinct that we have, we can go native, Right? We can adjust ourselves. That's when we adjust ourselves to make our environment feel like home. Big problem. Don't do that. Don't change yourself to try and pretend that this is home. Because the problem really is only mortals are at home in a mortal world. So for this to work out, we would have to suppress our true supernatural identity and try to ignore all of our urges for more than this, which you have and you know you do. You feel that feeling. So the only way to like pretend to be okay here is to deny who you are. And I have never seen the situation more clearly than the picture that C.S. Lewis paints in The Great Divorce. Have you read The Great Divorce? There's only a few of us. We're going to do it as a church. It's going to happen. You know what's great about it? It's like 85 pages long. Yeah. There is nothing that makes you feel better about yourself than knocking a book out in like one Saturday. You're like, I read a whole book today. I'm so on the ball. I had somebody in first service say they did that, that they were with a group of people who were climbing a mountain. And he's like, they all went up there because they're young and climbing a mountain. I sat down and they came back down and said, you climbed a mountain. I read a whole book while you were gone. And I was like, that's it. That's it. Anyway, great divorce, great, awesome book. In this book, he follows a character from a place called The Gray Town which is like a type of hell where everything is ghostly and just not quite real, right? Like it's just not quite solid. And he follows him from there to the high country, which is this type of heaven where everything has true, real, realer than real substance, so real it almost hurts a little bit. And although the gray town is also this perpetually twilight, like it's never quite daytime, and it's always a little bit rainy, it's just never quite right, right? All of that stuff is going, no matter what, all the inhabitants stay put, because they think that they have this one unique ability, which is to be able to think things into existence. So they can just be like, I want a new house, and they can just have it, and they have this house. So they are continually just building new homes, further and further from their problems. You don't like your neighbors, they would just go down here and go, okay, they're the problem, I'm gonna build another house. And then it would happen again, they just keep building, spreading out and spreading out in hopes that eventually they'd get someplace where they would finally be fulfilled. But no matter how hard they try to adjust themselves or their environment, all of those empty efforts just kept pushing them further and further and further from the high country 
until they're millions of miles away, millions of miles that they've moved away, which makes it impossible for them to really even consider going back because it's just so far now. And that's just so depressing. And then all you have at that point there is, is this eternity just trying to deny the desire that you have for something better because you can't make it all the way back, so you just lie to yourself and try to accept that gray town reality. So don't do that, okay? <laughs> don't do that. That was C.S. Lewis's picture of hell, and I thought it was really good, and I went, man, that's right. Oh my goodness, don't do that. Don't do that down here. Like, the, like C.S. Lewis's picture of hell, there are already billions of people here who have tried the same approach, and they can all confirm Snickers doesn't satisfy. <laughs> it don't, you know, because nothing does. This whole place doesn't satisfy. Stop believing that. People want you to buy that lie. It is not true. There's nothing here that can satisfy you. And no matter how hard we try to change ourselves or our situation, the real you will always hunger for your real home. Know that. So, listen to scripture. Why spend money on what is not bread, what, and, and your labor on what does not satisfy. What would you, why? That just is a fool's errand. Why would you do that? Instead, listen, listen, Linda, listen to God. It says it twice. He's making a point, you know, whenever he does, listen to God and eat what is good. And you will delight in the richest of fare. That's a promise. Listen to God. And I mean, look around. We know. They've known it since the beginning. We all know. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And not only so, but we ourselves who have that first fruits of the Spirit, you know, that taste of the good things to come, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our real bodies. So that's the key, guys. Try to see it that way. Try to see it that way. Try to see it as waiting eagerly. All right? It's a, it's a subtle nuance, but it's a big deal. Waiting eagerly. Here's the difference. Hunger focuses on what we're missing now. I'm hungry. I know what I want. I want it. Give it to me. Waiting eagerly focuses on what we're gaining later. Okay, not what you're missing now, what you're getting. When you get a taste, you go, oh, I can't wait for that. You know, the hunger is I want it. Now, why don't I have it? And if we can just get that perspective straight, we can see the purpose in the plan so much more clearly. And that changes everything. So ask yourself this question. Why would a loving God put us in an unsatisfying world? I thought he loved us. Why would he do that? And that is a very good question. It's one that we all ask. It's a good question. And so it's a good thing that the good book always leads us to a good answer. That's what it's for, guys. That's why we have it. For everything that was written. Everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. So that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement that they provide, we might have hope. Okay, so... Pay attention to that. These things, we're told, happened to them as examples. And they were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. Get that into your head. That's why we're reading these books. You can learn. It's for you. And back at the beginning, this is how that worked. Back at the beginning, God picked some people, his chosen people, right? He chose some people out of the crowd to teach the whole world with a big object lesson, saying, let me show you how this stuff works out. And since then, we've seen the Jews as our example of how he interacts with this world. And we've seen the Jews when they're obedient, when they obey. And we've seen them when they obstruct. And we've seen them when they hunger and when they feed and when they fail and when they succeed. And we've seen them do it at home. And we've seen them do it away like in captivity several times. I mean, we just keep getting the illustration so clearly. And although every experience that we see them go through and that we're learning from, that we read about, every experience can teach us something. God's word, if you read that book, it makes it clear, in a, like it's unfortunate, but it's true, makes it clear how constantly being homeless and hungry 
serves a very important purpose, that it's a good thing and it's part of his plan. He says, remember how the Lord, your God, led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble you and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. Remember when he did that for that reason? Remember, he humbled you, causing you to hunger. He was the reason why you were hungry. He caused you to hunger. And then feeding you with manna. But just enough. Just enough to keep you hungry. That was the whole story of the manna, right? Just today's amount, and you can't have any more, any less. He just gave you just enough to keep you always perpetually hungry. Why? To teach you. To teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Remember the listen, listen to the Lord and eat what's good? It's his word. Listen, listen to the Lord and eat what's good. Is that my alarm? Or do we have the same alarm? Are we alarm buddies? (laughs) What's going off right now? No, it should be done. 1130. Come on, let's wrap it up. (laughs) But this is it. Right? Okay, you get, you get the picture that, that he's painting for us there. Hunger isn't meant to make us testy. It's meant to make us tested. That's why it's part of the plan. It's, it's meant to make us tested so that we know our real home that we're destined for. Our real home requires all residents to be reliant and compliant. You can't make it up there unless you have those qualities. You have to be reliant and compliant. So this place down here teaches us and tests us for that kind of faith so that we know that we have it, so that we can make it up there. We need to be working toward that because you can't survive up there if you don't have it. So if you're getting there and you know that's what you're doing, in all this, you greatly rejoice. When you get that, that's what he's doing. In all this, you greatly rejoice. Though now, sure, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. But these have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith may result as it's supposed to, may result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. For you are receiving the end result of your faith. That's what you're working toward, which is the salvation of your souls. That's what we're working toward. That's what this whole thing is. For God did not appoint us. This is, look, if you think he's just torturing you, God did not appoint us to suffer wrath but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ leading us home. Okay, so it's not one, it is the other. And it is so easy to confuse the two. And we do this all the time as humans. So the question really is, this morning and this week, think about this. How do you see the hunger in your life? The whole roof going to fall down? That is terrifying noise. (laughs) Verizon still hasn't fixed it. I want that on record. And so, Anyway, how do you see the hunger in your life? That, this, is, this is the big question. Are you suffering wrath or are you receiving salvation? Because the very same thing can be taken two different ways. Are you, are you being tortured or are you being tested? You need to know. Yeah, both, right? <laughs> one starts one way and then it turns into the other one. That's for sure. And here's how you can tell. You just ask yourself, look at your life and see how have you handled your taste? How have you handled that bit of the goodness that the Lord has shown you? When you get that like moment of satisfaction, because we get them, like these little moments where everything clicks and it makes sense and it works and we're like, this is good. God is good. There is a plan. Things are working. And then it disappears and we go, where'd you go, God? What's going on here, right? But when you get that moment of satisfaction, do you think this is what I'm missing out on right now? I, I need this. Or do you think, oh, this is so good. This is what I'm gaining later. This is what I'm working toward. Because if you've got that gaining later mindset, this is how you should feel, okay? I want you to understand. This is like one of the most simple and profound pictures I think I've ever made. I looked at that and I went, that is living life down here. You see the torture in his poor little face? Just let me eat it. Please let me eat it. I feel like that's how I pray to God all the time. Come on, let me have this thing. Please just let He's like, not yet, not yet, not yet. Because you need to learn. This is, this is what we're supposed to do. Looking forward to it, trusting the master. Because if you're this, you can endure the discomfort of this world with that treat right on your nose. You can endure all of this because you trust the encouragement of Scripture to wait eagerly, eagerly, excitedly for what you want. Because you know that's how you get it, is to just trust in it. 
And meanwhile, if you don't see it that way, if, you don't, if you're not waiting eagerly, if, if the taste that you get of the good life makes you focus your hunger on what you're missing now instead, if that's your like, perspective that you're just kind of whiny and you're like, I like that, I want more of it, then you will feel more like this. Death grip right there. Don't think that you look any better than that from God's perspective. You are that, give it to me, give it to me, just stuffing it into your face. This is so accurate. It's, that should be convicting for so many Christians because that's just how we handle it. We're like, God is good. God, I want it all right now. That's, that's just what we do. Our first taste of God makes us just want to stuff our face with it. But that's not what it's meant for. That's not it. You're going to get that. We're going to get stuff later. It's going to happen. But the taste is not meant, the taste is meant to help us grow faith, not to grow fat. So don't stuff your face because it is a process that goes from baby to dog, apparently in my analogy here. But this is how it works. Scripture confirms it. Like newborn babies crave that pure spiritual milk ice cream, okay? Like cra <laughs> crave that spiritual milk so that by it, by that taste, you may grow up in your salvation. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. That's what that taste is for. It's not to have it all. It's to make you know that the Lord is good because once you do taste and see that the Lord is good, then it should inspire you to accept his orders, not give them because blessed is the man who trusts in him because you know that's where the ice cream came from. So did you tell me what I got to do to get this now that I know that you have it? And you just have to, in that way, to adjust that, the, you know, walk those steps from baby to dog to getting that, like, patient dog. We just have to remember that hunger isn't torture. It's a tool. Okay, that's by design. God built it that way. Everything has purpose. It's not torture. It's a tool. It guides us to grow up and gain the perspective that we need to see who we will be when we are truly satisfied up there at home. And so right now, the other thing that hunger does, it also tests our current levels of patience and integrity and humility and love because that is who you really are. That's what survives up there. And it tests for those things to see if our appetite is aimed at that real you. And so we can take that test. Let's try it out. Here's how we do it. First, you just have to realize Hunger tests our patience. You know that. You know that it tests. You've ever been around a hungry person. You know how hunger tests our patience. Because the real you doesn't make choices using snap judgments. It exercises patient pondering in all of its decisions. But hunger makes us hasty. Right? All of a sudden, your better thinking goes out the window. Hunger makes you hasty, and that's not you. You are not you when you're rash. So instead, aim at steadfast. That's who you are. Be patient, we're told. Be patient and stand firm. Because the Lord's coming is near. You'll get the rest of the ice cream. Just be patient. So check yourself on that. And then two, hunger tests our integrity. Because the real you, the real you, desires what is just instead of justifying what it desires. You know, you know that you should wait for it instead of just going, I don't care about anything, give it to me. But hunger makes us settle. 
Hunger makes us settle, and you're not you when you are compromised. That's not the real you, so aim at confident. Because we're told whoever walks in integrity walks securely home. But whoever takes crooked paths will be found out because you won't make it home. (laughs) You'll go somewhere else. So number three, hunger tests our humility because the real you is concerned by the needs of others more than its own. Did you see any concern in the eyes of the baby? (laughs) It was just for themselves, right? That's not the real you. That's the baby you. That dog is just looking at that master saying, when can I have it? When can I have it? When can I have it? But hunger makes us greedy. It's how it tests us. It makes us greedy. And you are not yourself when you're selfish. So aim at serving. That's the real you. Because God has shown you on purpose, shown you, O oh mortal, what is good. You got your taste. And so after the taste, what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to just walk humbly with your God. Obey the master. And number four, hunger tests our love then. It's just the natural next step. Because the real you sees all of creation and the whole situation as a God-given advantage to be appreciated, even if it's tough. But you don't see it as obstacles from an adversary. And it's real tough sometimes because sometimes you want to curse God and say, why did you do this to me? Oh, you're so making things so tough. But the real you knows that, thank you. We're doing something here, and I can't see it, but I know that you're at work. And hunger makes us hostile, right? It makes it really hard for us to see that. Hunger makes us hostile, and you are not you when you're hateful. So aim at thankful all the time. Because the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love as the master to deliver them from death. And keep them alive in famine. And that is some of the most key words you'll ever hear. You understand that? This is the God of the universe. Things change, though, when we understand how the God of the universe loves us. Because that is his love. Did you, did you see that? Keeping us alive in famine. Not ending all famines. Which he could do like that. But that's not his love. His love is to keep you alive in famine. Because in his plan, hunger helps us. This is a good thing. Hunger helps us to gauge and grow the reliance and the compliance that we are lacking, that we need to survive. So an unsatisfying world that feels like a famine and makes us hungry all the time is actually a huge blessing. Because just by living down here, we get the ultimate test of obedience versus indulgence. And that's the big thing. I mean, that's, that's what we need to know. That battle right there is your big battle. That battle needs to be our top priority. So he built life in such a way that it is. Because we need to see where we're at. Indulgence is our fatal flaw. And obedience is our saving grace. So we got to keep an eye on where we're at in those things. And hunger leads us to develop that obedience to get the real us to our real home for the real comfort that really satisfies that we've never experienced. So yeah, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Right? That's it. Eventually, you're going to have that treat on your nose and eventually he's going to say, okay, eat. And you're going to go, oh, it's so good and so great. But he's not doing it this way. You got to hear that. It's so funny because I remember this was a big problem I had in my pre-Christian years. I'm like, what is wrong with God that he's so intent on people liking him, right? Like if you do all this and accept all this difficulty, then you better put your eyes on me and love me. But this is not because God is such an egomaniac that he demands that everybody else love him. It's because we are. You get that? We are the self-centered babies who believe that we deserve whatever we want. And everyone should serve us and love us and be great. That's the problem. That's what he's trying to fix by saying, love me. It's going to cure that. Because God knows giving us what our earthly appetites want, our baby appetites want, would only work against the hunger that we should have for our real home. 
He's like, I can't let you be satisfied down there. You wouldn't come home. You got to hate it down there so that you are running full speed to get, come back home. That's what we're doing. And he's helping us hate it down here sometimes with, with that hunger. I'm just like, let's go, Lord. Yeah, he's helping us to get our eyes off of ourselves in this place. So stop worrying about it. Do not worry, saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear? Your heavenly father knows that you need them. He he created you in this whole place. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things are going to be given to you as well. Get it? That's why you take them off yourself and look to him. But we can't. We keep them on us. And contrary to little piggy logic, we can't cry we, we, we all the way home. It's not how it works. I was so proud of myself for thinking of that this morning. It was the last second right before I was like, we, we, we. Anyway, it's him, him, him all the way home. All right? That's how it should go. It's him, him, him all the way home. That's the only way we make it there. And so look, we know this. We, you know, you're lying to yourself if you don't think it's true. But we know it. We are all starving for something. And everything down here ain't real. And so you are not you when you are full of fake. So don't fill up on what's down here. Instead, here's the plan. Hold out. Look past this place. Hold out and stay hungry because only then are you able to just follow your gut all the way to your real home. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray, guys. Father God, oh boy, we love you. We love you even in the hard times. And we thank you for giving us the taste of your goodness that leads us into your presence. Holy Spirit, we ask that you just use our hunger as that test of trust that helps us to just start looking past what we're missing so that we can finally see what we are gaining. And Lord Jesus, we praise you for passing the test of this world to prove that our true identity has the patience and integrity and humility and the love to hold out for our truly satisfying home. And to that, everybody said, amen. Well, thanks for listening in. Why don't you join us on a Sunday morning? If you'd like more information about the church, just point your browser to hisplacechurch.com. Until next time, may the Lord bless you, keep you, and make his face shine upon you.